Section 9 of One by Crime. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. One by Crime by Frank Pinkerton. Chapter 5, Part 1. In a large handsome room, overlooking a shining river, now ablaze with sunshine, sat a beautiful woman, wearing on her face unmistakable signs of sadness. She scarcely heeded the opening door, until two pretty children came bounding to her side, clambering onto her chair and lap. Then her face changed, and a sweet, tender smile chased away all gloom. The idle hands were now busy stroking the curly heads pressed so close against her. I would have brought them to you before, but their father wished to keep them. He is always so happy when they are near, a little dark-eyed woman, clad in picturesque robes of brilliant crimson and gold, said rapidly, as she threw herself down on a pile of soft cushions opposite the sweet, pale mother. Leonor sighed, but she could not look sad long with those loved children clasped in her arms. "'I cannot understand Manuel,' she said, with a puzzled expression in her eyes. "'He is so strange, sometimes gay, almost too gay.' Then he relapses into a gloomy, brooding apathy, from which even the children have no power to rouse him. But you have. He is never too morose to have a smile for you. I think sometimes he feels lonely. You are bound to him, yet your heart is as unresponsive to his passionate love as if you were strangers, Savitre said thoughtfully. Do you think so, Savitre? I am indeed sorry, but you know how impossible it is to forget my first love. I like Manuel. But beyond that, affection, except for my darlings, is dead, buried in Louise's grave. Hush, here comes Manuel, Savitre whispered warningly. It was indeed Manuel, older and graver looking than of yore, with a deep melancholy in his eyes, brought there only by intense suffering. Savitre, on his entrance, softly glided from the room, leaving husband and wife alone. Leonore, he began, a bright smile lighting up his face, as he bent to kiss her fair brow. I have been thinking, and I am resolved to quit India and return to Portugal. I have been here long enough. Don't you think that will be pleasant, dearest? Nothing would please me more, Leonore cried delightedly. The greatest wish of my life is to see Portugal once more, to show our country to our children, bending to kiss her tiny daughter's face. Then it will be granted. Prepare to start as soon as possible." Now I am determined to leave here. Something seems to urge me to go at once. Only too anxious, Leonore began her arrangements. Savitre, who had never cared to leave her friend before, even to become Pantaleon's bride, entered into the preparations with unconcealed eagerness. She had faithfully promised her lover that, once in Portugal, she would, with his father's approval, marry him. Leonore felt no regret at leaving India, except for a loved grave, her father's, which she had so carefully tended. Not many days after, Manuel Tanza, his wife, children, Pantaleon, and Savitr, accompanied by several faithful servants, including Lali and Tola, embarked in a fine, stately ship, which was to bear them in safety to their home. Tanza seemed full of joy as he saw the last lines of the Indian coast disappear. He had rarely appeared so happy since his marriage with Leonor five years before. For several days the good ship went steadily on her way, until one night a terrific storm arose, and the vessel, heedless of the human cargo it was bearing, drifted onward at the mercy of the tempest. Tonza, holding Leonor and his children closely to him, stood silently dismayed, scarcely able to realize the awful danger which lay before him and those he loved. Still onward, through the almost impenetrable darkness, went the doomed ship, until, as the dense shadows began to clear and the storm to cease, a sudden shock was felt by all. She had struck against some rocks and was slowly sinking. "'We must be somewhere near land,' the captain cried, his voice sounding above the roaring waters. By aid of the fast-breaking dawn, they could see the line of high, dark rocks upon which the ship had met her fate. With much difficulty and peril, under the captain's cool directions, the crew managed at last to leave the sinking vessel, not without much loss of life. Out of nearly five hundred, only a few arrived in safety, amongst whom were Tanza, his wife, children, Savitre, and Pantaleon. When the day broke in calm splendor, the sun shone upon a mournful sight, 
a group of shipwrecked men and women. No sign of habitation met their view, only a weary waste of bare land, sheltered by a few trees, from whose branches hung a goodly supply of fruit. If we go further inland, we are sure to find some natives, if only savages, Tonza remarked gravely, and followed by the men, he commenced the long, weary way. Leonore, pale but firm, holding in her arms her little daughter, walked beside him, heedless of the fatigue which oppressed her and made her long to sink upon the sandy ground to rest. Onward they went, never pausing to rest their tired feet, until, as the day was about to decline, they came to a deep waterfall, over which they had to cross. No easy task, as the only means of doing so was by an uneven path, made from a line of rocks, on either side of which the boiling waters poured in terrific fury. Tonza, who, now the captain had perished, placed himself at the head of the crew, was the first to put his foot upon the crossing. Then, turning to the people, he said, Be careful, and not glance behind or down, or you will lose your balance and fall. Leonor, who, by her husband's wish, had given her child to one of the men, followed closely behind Manuel, who held his boy in his arms. Silently, without daring to murmur one word, the men walked bravely onward. They were nearly halfway across. Manuel had indeed touched firm ground, when a sudden cry from her little girl made Leonor turn in a fright to see what ailed her. End of section 9